Uh, the Honourable Clayton Cosgrove. Well, uh, that was a lesson in how not to do it from that member, Mr Speaker. No one actually knows uh, uh, what he said, and I won't. I won't. It would be like it would be an indignity to the House to sort of give that member more than a few seconds. Sir, this is an important piece of legislation, and I've got to say that the opposition's role is to oppose, but also to propose. But we are getting a little tired on this side of the House, sort of being the you know the, the guys with the, the, the guys with the shovel behind the elephant, cleaning up the mess made by this crew over here. You know, first it was the car park tax, they botched that, and I got to pay tribute as I did in the last speech to Mr Hayes, who, as I've said before, showed a ton of guts at the select committee in, uh, in, in actually saying and actually saying that government was wrong. No, I thought it was Maggie Barry. No, old man's beard, no. Uh, um, John Hayes has showed a ton of guts at the select committee in, in reining his members in and actually speaking out in the privacy of the select committee with no public presence, of course, but nonetheless, uh, and opposing that. And we cleaned that up. The iPad tax, the car park tax, we cleaned it up. So now we're cleaning this up. Because this bill, sir, was a mess from start to finish. It took away fundamental rights, fundamental rights of employees. And I'll say on record, and I think, I think it's a comment that at least most of us across the House would agree, that we have one of the top civil service in the world. Some of the best uh, public service in the world. A non-corrupt public service. Highly professional. But things go wrong. People are human, mistakes are made. And I want to touch on the point that Mr Parker made around what I sort of call the John Banks clause, the immunity clause, because there is a problem. If you actually track back what this does, it provides immunity in respect of a gross act of negligence if it occurs. So it may be something as simple as the boss says to the junior public servant, don't do it, whatever it may be, don't do that. And the public, the junior, not out of any maliciousness, uh, simply does it, gets it wrong, and acts in legal terms. Ms. Barry might want to work on this one in a grossly negligent way. So you then have a victim, you then have potential in, in, uh, injury or loss, and for, but that public servant has immunity. Now, what does that mean? That means that for the victim of that grossly negligent act, they cannot and they have no right to bring a suit against the Crown, virtually no right, because the Act in itself may carry no vicarious liability, and they have no right potentially to bring suit against the individual, the junior, who in a non-malicious way acted grossly and negligently. Now that I think is a step too far, and I say that simply not as a slur against the public service, but people are human. Things go wrong. We in our offices every day have constituents and people who come to us where something has gone wrong in the machinery of government. It could be ACC. Mr Little has raised and Mr Mallard a whole series of examples uh, over the last few years in respect of that. Many of those, I'd argue, presumably are not malicious, uh, are not done in a malicious fashion. They are what you'd commonly call a stuffer in, in, in Kiwi parlance. But there are rights for victims and those who have experienced loss or injury to have and to seek remedy. In this case, those rights, it appears to us, are taken away, and we have the John Banks clause, the immunity clause. You know, maybe Mr Banks would want this clause sort of extended to him, given his difficult and perilous circumstances at this point. And well, John Banks, Judith Collins, possibly even Peter Dunn, who knows, the list of suspects goes on. Chris Finlayson, my colleague, says the list goes on and on and on, the sort of rotten uh, foundations that are propping this crew up. The other point I want to make is this, is that one of the issues which I don't think, uh, which Mr Peters touched on, was the infamous strategy report that was leaked by, I think, this chap, Mr Lusk, who basically said that the objective of the National Party was to politicise the public service to the point, basically, where they just do what they were told. Now, that is a very, very dangerous thing. One of the great qualities... Michael Woodhouse agrees. Well, he's a Lusk acolyte, I think, or there's a couple of them, isn't it? Quite the opposite. Oh, OK. Oh, OK. He tried to clean Mr Lusk out. One of the great qualities... One of the great qualities of our public service is an unbiased, non-political public service that, in my experience when I was a minister, gave free and frank advice and would say to you, 
Minister, I think you're wrong if you're going to do this. But if quite often the trip, <laughs> but if the minister where the buck stops decided, no, no, I'm going to do it this way, I believe I'm right, then they would row the boat in the direction they would implement, as they should constitutionally, the wishes of their minister and their government, which they serve. But the point is, they would say to the minister, the public servants I'll deal with, I won't destroy their careers by naming them, they would say, look, we're going to give you free and frank advice. We believe this won't work. We believe it is the wrong course of action. Here is our recommendation, which is what you want from a professional, non-political public service. But I've talked to the odd public servant recently, and they now say things like, for instance, the staff-student ratios in education, stuff up par excellence by this crew. They were forced to back down by the weight and the pressure put on by parents. The Christchurch school closures, how it was done, why it was done, criteria being wrong, and other issues. Because I believe, and some public servants have said to me, that they now do not have the ability or they don't feel competent in saying to the Minister, we think this is heading for the rocks, we don't think in the case of Hekia Parada you can convince parents and there's no logic or data that says if you increase class sizes, your kids will get a better education, we think you shouldn't do this Minister, I don't believe that advice came. Likewise on the school closures, you shouldn't do it this way Minister, you should be front, you should front the schools. You should adhere to the, your own criteria which you set down for closures which you have departed on. This is not the way, Minister, to do this in Christchurch. That advice, I suspect, if it came, and I don't know if it did, and if it did it was not rigorous, was not listened to by, by, by the Minister. There is a feeling, I believe, in the public service that one, there's no point in giving contrary advice and saying to a Minister, we don't think this will work, or two, there's a bit of good old-fashioned intimidation where you know you're going to get trod on if you do give contestable, free and frank advice and say, Minister, this may not work, and therefore we do not get the highest possible advice from our public servants. Now, that might suit that crew over there who now have a strategy paper leaked which shows that they don't want that, they just want public servants like robots who will do their bidding. They want a highly politicised public service simply to do their bidding. They want a public service who effectively are political lackeys for them to do their bidding. Regardless of the constitutionality of it, the lack of it, regardless of the ethics, that's what's now in print in a strategy paper that Mr Peters alluded to. That is highly dangerous, that is grossly unethical, that is, not, uh, that is a, 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 a hit and an attack on our constitution and on the good name of public servants. Now, from time to time, of course, everybody likes to kick around the old public servant, and, to, and from time to time, bluntly, they deserve it. Some of them do. Some of them do deserve it. And some of them do act, and some of them do act, some of them do act from time to time a bit like the old Sir Humphrey, where there's a battle between the minister, because the minister wants to do something, and the, the public servant, the senior public servant, one or two in my experience, are implacably opposed, which goes beyond simply saying, hey, we think you, you should go the other way, but we'll implement. So there is a need, I think, for some discipline around some of those public servants, but I say it is very, very dangerous in our open little democracy where a government openly, overtly and bluntly is writing papers about politicising our professional public service. That, sir, is not on. That, sir, is wrong. Now, we will support this legislation because we cleaned it up. It was a mess from start to finish. Some incredible SOEs put up, SOPs put up, which broke the consensus, as Mr Mallard has said. Uh, ideas and clauses put up that would have stripped basic working folks. Public servants are entitled to get paid, especially the odd teacher, but these guys struggle with that concept. Um, that would have stripped them of basic rights, not outlandish rights, not luxuries, not things that any other citizen I wouldn't expect in their own privates if they're working in the private sector, basic rights. And that, sir, we cleaned up, and with the CTU and the PSA, which we should pay credit uh, to, uh, put in robust submissions. And I will give some credit to Mr Hayes and others whom we worked with to clean it up. But I've got to say, this is about the third time when the opposition has had to act like the guy with the shovel behind the elephant and clean up their mess 
The people deserve better, and we're getting a bit tired of providing the answers to these geniuses over Sorry, there. Sorry, the member's time. I call Maggie Barry. Oh, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I rise to speak to the state sector and public...